Steve here. Before we start the show, I just wanted to let you know that you can now support Rootbound on Patreon. Learn how, plus more ways to support the podcast at rootboundpodcast.com slash support. Now, on with the show. You are listening to Rootbound, a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. Hey, eat this weed! This episode of Rootbound is brought to you by Dandelion Greens, the free food in your own backyard. Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening to yet another episode of Rootbound. I'm your host, and my name is Steve. Listeners to the show will know that that sound means we have a special episode this week, and we will only be talking about one plant. Normally, we talk about two plants. The guest shares a plant, and I share a plant. But occasionally, there's a plant that is on my secret list of plants, and that means we have a special episode and means we are only going to talk about that plant. However, today's a little bit of a catch. I will admit, my secret list of plants is getting relatively short. Um, I don't know how many more traditional special episodes we're going to have. There's, there's only a few plants left, but this plant was not on my secret list of plants. However, when the guest today told me this is the plant they would choose, it was obvious to me that this plant meant something to me, and I could share something about it. So we have kind of a special, special episode It's not for my secret list of plants, but it's something that probably should have been. So we're going to talk about that plant right now, and that plant is soy. Hi, Ryan. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Rootbound. Hi, Steve. Um, Just just before we get going, just to set the stage, we we just had a nice little uh, Chinese takeout lunch. We're sitting outside of a little Chinese restaurant in a neighborhood that Ryan and I... Ryan and I both live in, and uh, so if you hear any background noise, traffic, people talking, occasional person watching sports on their phone, which happened a minute ago, that's what's going on, but hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, but yes, Ryan, do you have a plant to share with us today? Yes, I do, Steve, and that, uh, that, that is the soybean. Oh, wonderful. Yes. I knew you were going to say that, and because you're going to say that, I have to do this, which if, if you've listened to some episodes, you know that means that this is a special episode where we're only going to talk about one plant, which is soybean. Because when you told me you were going to talk about soybean, I realized, oh, wait, this plant is also meaningful to me. So you're going to tell me about soybean, and then I'm going to come in with some other soy things that, are, that I know about. Well, soy prepared, Steve. <laughs> yes, that is one of the best soy, soy puns ever, <laughs> if you speak Spanish. And, it, and it's still funny, even if you don't. Yes, true. <laughs> yeah, so, so Ryan, um, I think we need to discuss why you chose soy because we were texting um so the the theory in this podcast is that everybody has a plant that is meaningful to them and you almost uh disproved that theory almost not quite yeah so yeah how how did how did you explain how that went um do i have to (laughs) um it was i don't know i tend to overthink shit um can we curse on this thing yeah okay i tend to overthink it a lot and so i was trying to think about plants and i was thinking about it just a little too deep and I just couldn't think of it and then suddenly you and I were texting about it and I half jokingly said to you uh well soy is in everything yeah and I was like oh yeah yeah and it literally you know is I think you joked I was like well you gotta have a plant that's meaningful to you and you joked well I like those um impossible burgers yeah (laughs) and I was like oh well they're based on soy and you're like okay well let's do soy I'm like you're right soy is it and everything, so it should have it should have been the most easy go to answer. Yeah, and yet it took me the longest time to get to it. Yeah, I've been bugging you about this for for months. I feel I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. So yeah, what you have some? You, I mean, is there any other reason besides liking Impossible Burgers that's always meaningful to you, or is it just that well, it's in everything? Well, it, it, it's it's in everything, and and because I have you know some allergies and things like that, it's a really uh, you know ubiquitous food mm-hmm. that that can be. You know, part of all kinds of food and recipes. And so given its ubiquity, it was like, well, of course this is the answer because it applies just to 
you know, dietary things, and then I was doing research about about it to you know talk about it today, and I was like, I was actually more right about its ubiquity than I initially realized. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, you, but you don't have a soy allergy. I do actually. Oh, you do. Well, okay. I have allergy to to um, to dairy and things. So sometimes soy is a replacement for soy milk and whatnot. Oh, but can you have soy milk? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. So soy, you, I see. Soy I use soy as a, replace- as a replacement. I see. So, so, I mean, just quickly, we won't talk about it now, but the reason why soy is meaningful to me is because my wife, Carla, who you think is fake, who she's real for sure, she's been on the podcast, um, has a soy intolerance. It's not a full allergy, but it like upsets her stomach and gives yeah. her... And so anyway, I'm always trying to find stuff that doesn't have soy in it because... Uh, she has that intolerance and it's very difficult because in so many things but that's right. that's why it's in my brain and I realized oh when you said soy I was like oh I have to make this a special episode because even though it wasn't on my list of secret, secret list of plants it wasn't on my secret list of plants it's still very ubiquitous so yes I also stole your secret list of plants and I think that oh okay complicates. <laughs> I see anyway yeah so yeah what about some fun facts and dazzling details about the soybean uh, fun facts and dazzling details so the one that's been sticking in my head since you asked me to talk, come and talk about it is uh, it's actually also a um, soybean, soybean oil is a lubricant, mm, mm-hmm. and it actually lubricates the elevators in the Statue of Liberty. Whoa! Right? Whoa! That is a dazzling detail. Oh I was gosh. like, that's just I of all the things I was expecting to read, that was not one. Yeah! Wow! I guess, I guess it's a common lubricant in lots of other things, or. I don't. So or just the Statue of Liberty. Well, that was the one that stuck out of my head, but it, yeah. it, it's it, it's often a, a lubricant, and also that um, it can be used in cleaning too, mm. as a as a cleaning solvent, which I didn't realize. I didn't know that either. Wow. Um, what else did I? Oh, I learned that uh, I learned that the United States leads in soybean production. Yeah, I looked that up too, which is fascinating. Um, I well, I, well, I read that Brazil actually passed the U.S. recently. So maybe my Very close. data is out. Yeah, but they're but they're but they're pretty neck and neck, and way bigger than anywhere else in the world. And and I think China, which is where it, it originates, um, is actually fourth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I think I, I just looked at this map today. I just fresh my brain, and it's it's quite a far fourth, which is surprising. And I there's a little bit of theme on the show. There's a, this happens a lot where you have a food that is from a place but then becomes much more predominant in another place. And that, that happens a lot with things, but I think soybean might be one of the biggest ones. And then speaking of yeah. it being you know, ubiquitous in, in replacing things, uh, in, during the Civil War, um, because uh, coffee beans were so scarce, it was actually, the substitute was often uh, soybean. That's so funny. I feel like in the Civil War, those dudes were just making coffee out of whatever. Yep. Because it's happened like so many times this podcast already, I think. We talked about uh, dandelion root they did that with. We talked about yopon holly tea, which they did that with. And then we just recently talked about persimmon, and they would use the seeds of persimmon. So, yeah, I feel like I feel those dudes were just really desperate for coffee. They're like, whatever makes what, a whatever, brown liquid. Whatever's around, take it. <laughs> if it makes a brown liquid, I'll drink it. And then yeah. I think I was reading, too, roughly uh, something to the effect of one acre of uh, soybean uh, plant, uh, field Right, one acre of it um, produces something upwards of, I think, like eighty thousand crayons. Eighty thousand what? Crayons. Oh, because they use like the wax. Mm-hmm. Whoa! I never thought that crayons were made out of soy. Wow. Also, can be used. Um, I'm, I'm, I think they were all also used for ink, in some for, for oh, like yeah. for, for like newspapers and such too. So, again, a lot of things that are food-related and also just, like, in general life, there's some version of it that exists somewhere, right? It's an incredibly versatile plant. Right. And I think that's why I'm sitting here laughing, like, why did it take me so long <laughs> to get to it? And it was because I'm thinking about it in this, in this sort of inherently narrow context at first. Mm-hmm. And then I'm, like, thinking about it more in depth, and it's, like, applicable to so many different things. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you have any other fun facts or dazzling details about the soybean? Um, I think in the United States, there's roughly 75 million acres Wow, of soybean. That, uh, yes, that actually okay. is going to tie into something I'm going to talk about a bit later, but that is a staggering number of, of, of beans. <laughs> that is, um, I think those are the ones that stick out in my head. If, I'm, if I remember any as we were talking about it, I'll throw them in right now. Yeah, sure, yeah. I, I, well, that's the fun thing about the special episodes is, is, like, we're both talking about the same plant, so we can kind of jump back and forth. I did write down a few things about soy. Um, 
I think the one thing we've covered a little bit already is just how like versatile it is, and we didn't really talk about it. we talked its versatility even just in food. Um, so, just just a list of a few short things that is like just soy, tofu, right? Miso, tempeh, soy sauce, soy milk, soybean oil, textured soy protein, which they use as a lot as meat substitutes, um, and then soy lecithin, and then there's also this food which I've been a little bit obsessed with and I've never had, called natto. Have you ever heard of natto? No. Natto is... I'm natto familiar with it. <laughs> Good one. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, so natto is a kind of fermented soybean, so it's whole soybeans fermented with a particular bacteria called Bacillus subtilis. And when it's fermented, it, it looks like just a bowl of beans, but when you pick it up with a fork, they're, they're coated in this like sticky, gooey stuff. Mm. It, it, it does not look appetizing to, I think, a Western palate. It's, it's from Japan. Um, but apparently, so this is, a, this is a line from Wikipedia about it. It says, natto is often considered an acquired taste because of its powerful smell, strong flavor, and sticky, slimy texture. I feel like that's putting it mildly, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I, 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 I stumbled on something about natto. I think I found this YouTube channel that's a guy named Natto Dad, and he just makes a lot of natto. Um, I've been wanting to try it. I never tried natto. It, it, it's one of those like foods that I, yeah, I've been really wanting to try. It's supposed to be, like, if you can acquire the taste, it's supposed to be very good. But I definitely, I think a lot of people who are from where we're from look at it, and it does not look appetizing. traditionally appetizing. But, yeah, I definitely want to try natto. And then I must say, as you were, as you were uh, relaying that, I thought about the fact that... Uh, so apparently, there's a lot of misconceptions about soy too, in terms of what it, it can do to, to the body. Mm, mm-hmm. right? And one of the one of the misconceptions I think is that um, because it's hot, it has high levels or at least increased levels of uh, like estrogen. In yeah, it. right. There's a it's a different word. It's like not exactly. It's not quite that, but right. it's, it's a similar it's compound. Yeah. That that there's misconceptions about what that kind of can do, particularly for men. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and there's all these just misunderstandings about um, what it can do to the body, and they're just not true. Like that, that it will increase kind of the breast tissue in men. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it won't. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I read that too. I think it's probably one of those things where you would have to eat like a ridiculous amount of it for it to, and a ridiculous amount of anything will mess you up in some way, right? Right. Yeah. But also as a as a pivot to that, it, it can actually help reduce the uh, likelihood of breast cancer in women. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. Um, in addition to the wonderful benefits for skin and hair. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I should eat more stuff, but like I said, I can't because my wife is, uh, uh, has that intolerance. Actually, today, because we were going to talk about soy and I knew that Carlos can have uh, yogurt for breakfast, I bought some tempeh bacon okay. and had tempeh bacon with my eggs this morning. It was pretty good. Um, so another fun fact is on the Wikipedia page for soy, there's a chart of soy and all the other main staple foods around the world. Okay. And soy, by far, in most of the categories, in the raw form, is way better than all of the other foods. In, in energy, protein, fat, and many minerals, soy is, like, by far. However, the catch is you cannot eat soybeans raw. Oh. Because they have uh, serine protease inhibitors, which are apparently not good for you and over time could be toxic if you, if you eat it raw. So... You have to uh, you have to cook it, and then then it's not quite as nutritionally dense as, as the table shows, but it's still very good for so you. So raw cookie dough, yes, raw soy bean, no. Indeed, okay. indeed. All right, good. But but going to um, going to the fact that soy is a very dense protein, uh, dense nutritional food that leads me to have to talk about Bob Dylan. <laughs> okay, you can't see my face right now, but yeah. like, what? So I don't know. You're a little bit younger than me. I don't know if, if uh, the words the words soy bomb mean anything to you. No, but Bob. I mean Bob Dylan. Yes, because well, my dad famously, when he plays guitar, likes to sing everything in the cadence of Bob Dylan. Okay, yeah. So that's about my knowledge base of Bob Dylan. Okay, so soy bomb doesn't ring any bells no okay when i was thinking about soy today this word soy bomb came in my head and i had this little memory about it and then i had to go look it up and like remember exactly what it is and so what what this is what happened the grammys you wait till i get to soy okay the grammys 1998 bob dylan is on stage with his band performing the song love sick 
super chill song he's up there playing. It's, it's like a, one of those, and the setup was kind of like a MTV Unplugged setup, so like the audience is kind of behind him, right, and it's kind of very informal, you know, vibe. He's playing and chilling, and then out of nowhere, I'm going to read the quote from The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, in the, out of nowhere, a man named Michael Portnoy removed his shirt, and the words soy bomb were painted on his chest as he began dancing with his eyes closed in a contorted and robotic manner. So Bob Dylan's playing the song. This guy just jumps on the stage of the audience with no shirt. He has the words soy bomb written on his chest. And he's just, like, dancing in this very strange, like... Was that considered a terrorist action? <laughs> Maybe. And, and the funny thing about it is Bob Dylan just completely... The guy is right next to him. He's, like, standing <laughs> right next to him. you got to look at the video. It is hilarious. He's standing right next to him just, like, doing this weird, like, interpretive dance <laughs> to this chill Bob Dylan song with the words soy bomb on his chest. And, uh, and he's up there for, like... Like over half, like thirty over thirty seconds, just like dancing, and then eventually security pulls him away. But apparently, the reason why he had that on his chest, and this is a quote he said, he later said he used those words because soy represents dense nutritional life, and he wanted art to his art to represent dense transformational explosive life. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay then. Yeah. So um, that's that's why Bob Dylan is related to soy. That's I'm never gonna look at that the same way again. Yeah. It, I'll put a link to that video in the show notes because yeah, I only had this like brief memory of it, and it being a thing in 1998 and like people saying "soy bomb" and related to weird dancing guy, but I forgot the details and I never actually I think I never actually saw the video and seeing how, like there's one point where Bob Dylan I think kind of like mildly mugs to the camera of like get a load of this guy, <laughs> but he he's very cool about it and it it is it, it I think it was art so good job Michael Portnoy wherever you are and then I think the the final. Uh, piece I wanted to talk about is is that thing where you said that soy has 75 million acres yeah. in the United States. And so this was really fascinating. I think this is also from the Wikipedia for soy. It says, although practically unseen in the United States in 1900, by 2000, soy plantings covered more than 70 million acres, only second to corn. And, and some say, it's citation needed on Wikipedia, that it has become America's largest cash crop. Which is so, which to me is surprising considering that it came to the United States yeah. in like 17, it's like, like 1770 something. It hasn't been here that long. No, and it, it has overtaken, and that's because it has all these really amazing uses. It is a phenomenal food, but it's one of those things where it actually made me look up the origin of the phrase, too much of a good thing. Hmm. Um, which apparently comes from Shakespeare, the, 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 the play As You Like It, and the context in that is not really applicable. But it's a, it's a phrase we use a lot. And I think humans has the tendency to do something. We find something amazing like soy that has all these uses, and then we say, well, we're just going to go all in on it. 100%, we're not going to have any moderation. And, that's, I mean, yeah. that's, how, that's how America does everything. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes that's great, and sometimes yeah. it's bad. Yeah. And in the case of soy... You know, it is a very good food and it is good in a lot of ways, but, you know, its problems in the United States are um, monocropping, which is not great for the soil. Like, if you just have all of the same plant, uh, it tends to have an overuse of pesticides and herbicides. And when you, when, you, or, uh, when you grow foods like that, which is not good for runoff, um, there's some people say that the way that it is grown like that can, uh, is, is, is uh, helping to exasperate these kind of soy intolerances because it's, it's an overuse and that's how allergies happen. And that's more complicated, I'm not sure that it is. But it is definitely not always positive in the U.S. itself because of the way the farming practices are. And even worse, in Brazil, the Amazon rainforest is being cut down to grow soy. Yeah, which is not good. And then also, not that long ago, there was like a moratorium of soy in the Amazon, but there's a lot of loopholes about that. But then they just moved to this area south of the Amazon that is, I'm blanking on the name, the Sahato, I think it's called. It's this, it's this uh, very beautiful like plains area, but now they're converting that into soybean. So it's still a, like a nice natural ecosystem. It just didn't have forests. It was a different kind of ecosystem. So, so to grow all that soy is probably not great for the planet. And it's one of those things where if we could just, as humans, chill a little bit and just like have a little bit more moderation, it, things could be more positive with this really great, amazing food. Yeah, and that's, but that's how we get to be number one, right? Yeah. We, we, we overdo everything. Yeah, yeah. And it also reminds me of something that my friend said in the episode about cor corn, which corn is a similar kind of plant, right? It's taken over the globe, amazing food, but we just push it too far, and now it's become this like weird commodity. Uh, but but my friend in uh, Raluca in that episode said, but it's not s s corn's fault. In this case, it's not soy's fault. Soy is not a, the, the negative things about soy are not soy's fault. It's what we have put upon soy as humans. 
I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of, I can't remember his name. Was it, not, it wasn't Noah Ritter for the TBTL heads that are listening to this. <laughs> but um, uh, recently there was the, the corn. Oh, corn, yeah, it's corn. It's corn, but I can't it, think of a more beautiful thing. It was the kid, right? Yeah, corn kid, yeah. Cor- corn kid. There yeah. could, there should be a soy kid, I guess. There should be, that was It's my soy. God. It's soy. <laughs> <laughs> A small lump with knobs. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely as um, ever-present as soy. It's actually kind of interesting, though, how even though soy is actually, I think, bigger than corn in the United States now, it doesn't have the, the cachet that corn has in popular culture. Although, with its applicability towards, like, biodiesel and stuff like that, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think in some ways it's more versatile than corn. It's just I think corn has more of a... A mythos in our culture. Yeah. And and I don't know if uh, soy will ever have that kind of mythos, because corn is just a more iconic looking food, you know? S- corn is like big and yellow and says, hey, I'm, I'm corn. And if you've ever seen a soybean plant, it, especially when it's ready to harvest, it's just this kind of weird brown mass. Well, soybean mass. plant really, just didn't really, really isn't as corny. Good one. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I guess that just wraps up our episode about soy, so thank you, Ryan, for telling me so many dazzling details and fun facts. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we are sitting outside. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, yep, that's cool. This is, uh, this is the, the art of on-the-fly production. Indeed. Uh, so I guess that... Mm, wait, one second. Wait for it. <laughs> wait for him to come back yeah. the other way. It's a loud thing. All right. So annoyed. <laughs> well, that about wraps up our episode about the soybean, Ryan, so thank you for joining me. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we're sitting outside of a little uh, Chinese restaurant. And, you know, there's a lot of soy used in Chinese food, as we mentioned. It's, it's from there originally, also used in Japanese food. And I thought it would be fun maybe at the end of this episode to read our fortunes. Oh, yeah. So I actually opened mine early and ate me cook- my cookie too fast, but I didn't look at my fortune. It's in my pocket here. So if, if Ryan, you want to open your cookie while I read my fortune, okay. and then you can read your fortune after I read mine, okay? And there might be some uh, audio. With yeah, the... there's some crinkling that's just a cookie opening, and that's just a, uh, a theater of the mind. This is me struggling with a wrapper, which is not unheard of. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, mine... Uh, my... Uh, so my fortune says, discontent is the first necessity of progress. I mean, that's what spurs you to motivation, right? Yeah, yeah. So maybe, I mean, related to soy, maybe our discontent with the way soy is, is overproduced can, can spur us as humans to progress in maybe diversifying our, our uh, agriculture world a little bit. Okay, so now the trick is, does my fortune, which I have not yet read, can I tie it back to soy? That let's, is... Let, let's, Go for it. That's the test. So my fortune says... First of all, my fortune said... You know what, Steve? I'm out of here. My fortune gave me the lottery numbers. Oh. <laughs> you, you won. I won. Uh, no, my... Um, calamity is the... Is the uh, meh. My fortune says, Calamity is the touchstone of, of a brave mind. That's a weird one. <laughs> And I guess I'll say to that, soy confused. <laughs> but I'm good one. Do you know what that sound is? That is a chapstick tapping on top of a jar of natto. Yes, I'm going to try natto, and I bought a jar at my local supermarket, and I have all the fixings here to prep it in kind of its most basic form. So in front of me, I have a little bowl of rice. I put some radish on there just to liven it up a little bit. I have a little bit of soy sauce in a small container, and then some chives and some basil for my garden uh, in another small container, and then I have an empty bowl and a pair of chopsticks. 
and this jar of natto. So I'm gonna crack open the jar here. And there it is. And let's just uh, give it a smell here. It just looks like little tiny beans. Um, I can't really see much of that sticky stringiness right now, but it does have a strong smell. A little bit like cured meat, maybe. Okay, so what I read you're supposed to do, I guess this step is optional, but I guess it's encouraged, and I'm gonna try it now, is you, you take the natto that you're gonna put on top of your rice and you put it aside separately in another bowl. So I'm doing that now. Oh, I can see the stringiness. <laughs> cool. I'm gonna put a little bit of natto in this extra bowl on the side. Okay, hopefully I didn't give myself too much because, uh, yeah, hopefully I like it because it's a decent amount. <laughs> and then, you're supposed to, I'm gonna move the bowl with rice out of the way. Then you're supposed to pour a little soy sauce over it here. So I'm gonna do that now. And then you're supposed to take your chopsticks and kind of whip it up and you make it kind of foamy, I guess. So I'm gonna try that and let's see. And then when you're done with that, you put it on top of the rice and you eat it. So no. hopefully you can hear that. Okay, I'm gonna whip up this natto. Oh yeah, it's getting bubbly. Oh wow, cool. Um, this is supposed to increase the effect, which in Japan is called neba neba, which has to do with this kind of like sticky foaminess, I guess. Uh, Japanese speakers, you can correct me on that pronunciation, but yes, there's a word called neba neba that uh, refers to this process, or I guess the result of this process. Oh wow, it's all foamy. That's so cool. I'm going to stop and take a picture of this foaminess stuff before I stick it on top of my rice. Take a little picture for the Instagram. Oh wow. Yep, and now it's all foamy, so now I'm going to pour it on top of my rice and then top it with some chives, and we will try it. Here we go. Pouring it on top of the rice. It looks, looks quite unique to my, to my uh, Western eye here, but it, it, it doesn't look not tasty. Okay, now we can just put a few chives on top. Chives and some, I, I don't think basil is traditional here, but I just had some in the garden, so a few, just a few leaves of basil on top. I figure it would, wouldn't hurt. Some chives. Okay, one more picture for the gram before I destroy this by eating it. Oh, it looks nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, follow me on Instagram, at Rootbound Podcast, if you want to see a picture of this um, natto and rice. All right, let's take a bite. I'm gonna use the chopsticks here, get a little bit of the natto, a little bit of the rice, a little chives. Let's see here. Here we go. That's actually really good. I, I, I don't see that. I mean, I, I can see how the texture might bother people because it's so slimy but it just tastes like a, a really good, like savory bean dish or something. Mm. Very complex. You know, it has a little bit, if you, if you eat not edamame, it does have a little bit of that soy-ish flavor, but it's, it's deeper, you know, it's not as fresh. Cool, well now I can say that I've tried natto, uh, inspired by this episode about soy. And I think that will wrap us up for this episode of Rootbound. My guest on this episode of Rootbound was Ryan Honick. Ryan is a disability advocate, speaker, and professional persuader. You can learn more about Ryan at his website, which is Ryan Honick, that's H O N I C K dot com. Rootbound is hosted by Steve Soybaum Ellington. Music by Christian Krigiskota. Fake ads by David Lani. You know, Rootbound is a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside, but if you can go outside, you could dance robotically next to Bob Dylan. Hey, eat this weed. Power out. Now that.